Uh, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, uh, I'm reading out of the ESV version, but this is what the Word of God says. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin, indeed, was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So there we go. Um, This passage, I was telling folks that uh, this passage right here actually is acknowledged by people as the most difficult passage in all of Paul to interpret. (laughs) So, you know, we have a small task tonight. Uh, But you can see maybe why, because there are some really tricky aspects to this passage. But the overarching point here, guys, that we can focus on tonight is that we're seeing a comparison between Adam and Christ, right? If you know anything about what the Bible teaches, okay, there is a very important passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, sorry, verse 45, There, Paul identifies that there's actually Adam, uh, number one, and there is Adam, uh, number two. And so, does somebody want to read that real quick? Carl, can you? Are you not flipping? You're swiping? Swiping's the worst, because now you got to go in and got to get in there with the AI and everything. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45 That's super important because the amount of passages in the Bible that connect Adam to Jesus Christ are very few. There there are there, and there are several that are very important for us to see. Maybe some other ones. Luke uh, chapter 3, verse 38, for example. There, uh, you know, is one of those chapters about the genealogies, right? You You have it in Luke, you have it in Matthew, you have a very short genealogy in Mark. But in Luke here, um, Adam, very important that Adam there is identified as the son of God. And so a lot of people don't know that, but that's what he's called. You got it there? Okay, great. Yeah. (laughs) Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Yeah, so the last Adam literally is, um, uh, it says the second and last, what does it say there? It says the first man, Adam, became a living being. Uh-huh. The last Adam became a living, given spirit. Okay. Life-giving. And then a life-giving spirit. Yeah, that's right there. Yeah. So there where it says that Adam became a living being, he's talking about Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, uh, which is very important. That's, that's where Adam comes to life. God creates him. It says God uh, put his spirit within him, right? And Adam became a living being. And so what Paul is saying there in Corinthians is that the, and the fulfillment of that imagery is in Jesus, in his resurrection, right? Not becoming a living being, but giving life, becoming a life-giving spirit, which is remarkable uh, to think about. So very heavy, uh, you know, the theology here is very heavy, but this is the overarching thing. It's like, well, I don't know what, I don't know what Pastor Miller was talking about tonight. We just remember that we're talking about the fact that Adam and Christ go together, that you cannot contemplate the work of Christ without contemplating the, the, the role that Adam played. And what is that role? Well, we can say that Adam represents a federal role. What is, you know, uh, comes from the, uh, it comes from the uh, Latin phedos, which means covenantal or uh, covenant or legal representative, right? Uh, He is the representative of mankind when he is born, right? Uh, We know that for certain because when Adam uh, sins, right, his sin, even as this passage goes on to say, affects everybody, (laughs) right? So he is our legal representative before God. And that's actually one of the things that makes this passage challenging is that first and foremost, we're thinking of Adam as our legal representative head. 
And then when I say challenging, it's philosophically challenging for folks to think about why should I suffer for the sin of Adam? I, was, was it, I didn't eat the apple, right? Or I didn't eat the forbidden fruit. Uh, forbidden fruits, Trisha would remind me later, it's not an apple. You know? <laughs> it doesn't say apple. <laughs> but but he, does, he does eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he was commanded in that relationship with God not to. So he broke the, the, the agreement that God had made with him. And later we'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, then we're, we're, we're sort of uh, p- we're presented with this dilemma. Why does the entire human race suffer because of the decision of one man? It's kind of like, here he is, right? That's Adam, by the way. Uh, you know, and he is kind of representative of all these people, all of humanity, every person who has ever, will ever, and has ever lived. He is the representative. Listen, we understand federalism today. If Joe Biden, if Joe Biden did something really foolish, let's say he went to the war with Russia or China or something, he is our federal head. And you would call your friends and family right now, and you would say, we're at war with China. And, they would, and the person would say, I didn't do anything to China. It doesn't matter, because your legal federal representative has, in a sense, made that decision for you, you see. And, and therefore, he represents all of humanity, um, right? He represents all all of humanity, so too Christ as the second Adam, in the same way he represents all of his humanity. Now we need to be very careful, guys, here as evangelicals, that we do not subscribe and make the mistake that there is a complete one-to-one correspondence between Adam, number one, uh, and number two, okay? Why? Who did Adam represent? Who? How many people who? Everybody! And his sin was given to every single one of us. Every single one of us has Adam's sin nature, his guilt, his corruption, pollution, and death sentence. Who did Jesus represent? See, we can't say everyone because then what we would be saying at that moment right there, it's kind of controversial, but at that moment we would say that every single person, no exceptions, has Jesus' righteousness and are now fellow heirs of the eternal kingdom of God with him. That's not true. That's called universalism, okay? And universalism is not taught in the Bible. It was the Lord Jesus himself who said, narrow is the way and difficult is the road that leads to eternal life. And what does he say? Few will be there that find it. So in this situation, it's best to say Adam represents all of his humanity and Christ represents all of his humanity, namely those who by the grace of God will repent and believe in the gospel. You see, any questions about that? That's a heavy, I know that can be kind of heavy, but, but I want you to see, maybe more than anything, you guys, that God does not look at this world the way that we do. Everyone is for themselves. Everyone is about self-expression. Everyone is about self-realization. My goodness, we have the gurus, right, telling us, know yourself, express yourself, find yourself, right? All of this stuff. God sees everything through a federal kind of eye, right? Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A different passage, but one that summarizes precisely this point. Um, Let's look at verse 20. 1 Corinthians, I'll just write it down here. 1 Cor 15, beginning verse 20, following. I'll erase this because it's getting a bit too much, but What does it say here? It says here, But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. Basically what that means is the firstfruits is that uh, he represents a mighty harvest. Uh, That is rooted in Old Testament imagery. 
where as they did the harvest for the nation, they had the first fruits of the harvest. And many times the priests, they were supposed to wave the branches of the first fruits. You know what they were doing? They were actually embodying the coming resurrection. That there would be not just a first fruit of literal physical harvest, but that 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 imagery in the nation of Israel actually represented in type and shadow the coming resurrection of believers. So just anyway, that's where the first fruit language comes from. Verse 21, for as, as by a man came death, that's talking about Adam, okay? By a man ha, uh, uh, has come also the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22 is the key. For as in Adam all die. Right here. But also in Christ shall all be made alive. And again, if we're not careful there, when it says all, you read the commentaries here, they all point out, of course, that Paul is not talking about universalism, but this dynamic in which as Christ is representing a particular humanity. And that humanity, for example, if you want a text on that, is Ephesians chapter 2, verse, oh, I don't know, 12 through 18. That's going to be a really good cross-reference to see that, in fact, the humanity that Jesus Christ is representing is a, human, is a new humanity that he is making, what? Out of Jew and Gentile. Here, turn with me in your Bibles real quick to um, uh, Revelation chapter 5. Just very quickly, if you want to, it's kind of like, I'm so grateful for Revelation. How many of you guys are scared of the book of Revelation? Be honest. Be honest. Must be honest. <laughs> My wife's over there. Yep. yep. I don't want her. I love the book of Revelation. But one of the reasons why is because the book of Revelation should be so comforting to us. Yes, it has apocalyptic imagery. Yes, it has judgments that are just terrifying to read and things like that. But it also, guys, it's also the cliff notes we're also kind of getting a cheat sheet. We know how it all ends. God is giving us a, a beautiful, comforting insight into the absolute future, the absolute end. And what does Revelation 5 say there? Verse 9 and 10. Here, read it. Um, you there, brother? Neil can read it for us. Uh, Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10. Yes, yes, please. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Mm -hmm. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. There you go. So this, that's, the, that's referring there to the humanity that God redeems. It's not universalism, but it is universal in the sense that he saves from, and you actually, your translation, whatever you're using, 2020? 2020? So. Okay. But anyway, so it does actually have the preposition from. Does your Bibles have that? He saved, fr he saved from every tribe, right? Nation, all that, right? That comes, from the, that comes from the Greek preposition ek, which just is a preposition that means out of. Uh, and so that's very important because, again, we are not saying exhaustively, as the ancient heretics, Socinians, would say, for example, that, that Jesus Christ provided a salvation that will, in fact, at the end of the day, redeem every single person, no exceptions whatsoever. If that is true, my dear brothers and sisters, then Jesus is a liar. Uh, and we cannot possibly, uh, we can't entertain that proposition at all. And so um, this is where some time ago, a, a, a liberal theologian, or not even a theologian, but uh, a liberal guy by the name of Rob Bell. You guys heard of this? Okay, should have called him Rob Oprah. But anyway, he ended up going to, on, on Oprah and other shows and talking about that very thing. He wrote a book called Love Wins, how that in the very end, God will save everybody. And remarkably, it was... Uh, it was uh, uh, some secular interview that he did where the secular interviewer was grilling him and telling him, you, you, you're making this doctrine up, aren't you? You're, you're literally just teaching this just to gain points with the, with the culture, aren't you? And I mean, just this guy's just crumbling, you know. But this is what happens when you deny biblical theology, biblical federalism, when you don't understand Adam 1, Adam 2, his humanity, his humanity. You end up in all of this error, and we can't possibly... We can't possibly um, 
a hold to that if we're going to be consistent Christians and, uh, and hold to, to all of that. So anyway, any questions on any of that? There's a lot more we're going to, Lord willing, say here about it. Let's go to the text and just kind of work through this slowly. Romans chapter 5, again, he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, the most important t- passage there is where it says, All men sinned. This is, that is the, that is the crux interpretum. That, in other words, that is the key right there. And that is the, that's, actually the, that's actually the epicenter of the controversy. What is, when Paul says there um, that death spread to all men because all sinned, all men sinned. Why? Well, actually, it just says all sinned, but you know what I mean. Uh, how did all men sin? And the point of that is to say that all men sin, in the context, all men sin in Adam, again, as their representative. And so you have, for example, here, let me get back there myself. You have maybe um, Romans 5. Is that where we are? Yeah. Okay. Okay, look at verse 15 again here. Just, to, um, yeah. just jump down to verse 15. The free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. See, um, you guys don't get tripped up by the language of the many, right? Jump down to verse 18. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, at verse 18 and 19, but it says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness uh, leads to justification and life for all men. By the way, one act of righteousness is actually referring to the totality of Jesus' life. Verse 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, here it is again, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, here it goes again, the many will be made righteous. So this is Paul's way of referring to the humanity issue that we were talking about before, the many, the many, the many. And in fact, there's another verse that you guys can maybe look over real quick. It's Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. There again, the suffering servant, which we now know to be the Messiah, uh, he dies and he suffers for what? To justify the who? The many. And that is Jesus' humanity. And so uh, this this, uh, language here, therefore, it has to be representative of the fact that, again, he is representing a distinct humanity. So when we go back to our text in verse 12 through 14, as he says here, uh, we, we learn something here, guys, about the way that sin works. Number one, there is the imputation of Adam's sin. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, you see that? Through one man. Um, this, is, um, this is how imputation works. Uh, where is the language of imputation in this passage? Look down to verse... Where is that at there? Verse 13. Sin is not what? Counted. What does your guys' Bible say? Imputed. Imputed. Wow, your, well, your Bible just cut right, cut right to the chase. Anybody else have, have a different... Legatos is just the, 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 that, that idea of reckoning, counting, in a more mature, uh, developed meaning of that word, it is imputation. Now remember, in the Bible, we did this already, uh, in the Bible, and this is what's cool about recording this, is that you can go back and watch this again, but in the Bible, there are three distinct imputations. There is the sin of Adam, let's say, and he affects all of humanity, right? And then there is the sin of all humanity imputed to Christ on the cross, right? So sinners from here, represented here, are now imputing their sin to Christ on the, uh, to Christ on the cross. From the cross, oh, this... These, these markers, 
Okay. You understand how long my relationship goes back with these markers here. <laughs> Frustrating that type of goes to what? Then his work, his righteousness now affects the humanity that the Bible is talking about. So there's, th there's three legal transactions. Adam's sin to all of us, the sinners that Jesus represents on him, and then his righteousness, hallelujah, applied to us so that we can be made righteous. You see that? You guys, despite what this world thinks, God does not operate upon therapy. God doesn't operate upon moralism, what we talked about last time, that you're pulling yourself up by your moral rung. You are not on the treadmill of self-righteousness where you're trying to row, 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 row your boat out of the way to heaven, trying to work out your salvation by the deeds that you do, hoping, as Roman Catholicism would teach, that you have done enough at the end of the day, you've done enough, maybe when the scales of judgment are weighed, God will say, okay, uh, yeah, you went to church enough, you prayed enough, you read your Bible enough, I guess I'll let you in. That's not the gospel. That's heresy, actually, right? That would, that would amount to a works-based salvation. God looks at everything through the aspect of imputation. Is the righteousness of Jesus imputed to your account, yes or no? That is, one theologian said, when you, go to, when you stand before God in eternity, it's not time to decide whether you go to heaven or hell. Why? Because that's already been decided on the basis of whether or not Jesus is your righteousness. You see? And just to illustrate that, go to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, one passage that we should all memorize and we should all really, really just immediately know that that's where we go. It's, it's uh, Philippians chapter 3, beginning of verse 7. But there in the context, what the, what's the context there? The context there is that there are Jews who are trying to impress people in Philippi by how righteous they are, how Jewish they are, how they eat, how they dress, how they pray, how they worship, what direction they pray, all of that. Basically... Pharisaical, you know, Pharisaicism, right? And Paul then goes on to say, look, if anybody's Jewish around here, I'm Jewish, <laughs> right? And he gives this whole list of why he, of all people, qualifies as a righteous Jew. But what does he say in verse 7? But, he says, whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, he goes further. He actually gets kind of crass in this verse. He says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as what? Rubbish, right? That's actually a very strong term. He says, in, a, in order that I may what? That I may gain Christ. This is what he's after. This is what he's after right here. And he says here that I may be Found in him, here we go, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. You see that? Paul understood, and then he goes on to say, look, that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, so that I might be conformed to his image, all of these things. He wants to, he wants to uh, make it very clear that his hope is solely and squarely upon the righteousness that has been earned and merited by Jesus Christ, the second and last Adam. So if you go back to Romans chapter 5, any questions about that? I'm fine if you guys slow me down. Uh, if you guys ask any question or anything whatsoever, we're not, I don't really have an agenda here, but uh, I'd like to get through the verses, but uh, you guys know how that goes with me. <laughs> uh, I tend to go kind of slow. But as we looked at the imputation of Adam's sin, also consider the reign of death. Ready? He says here, and all have, sin um, uh, all have sinned. Uh, no, no, I'm in chapter 2. Um, I need glasses, but I won't wear them. <laughs> Kaylee's like, I'm always talking to Kaylee about glasses. I just won't wear them. I, just, I hate them. But anyway, uh, you know, so it says here, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So death comes as a consequence of sin, right? You ever do an evangelism situation? Tease this out. Why do you die? 
And if you have a, if you have somebody who wants to be kind of smart, they'll say something like, well, because, you know, um, the second law of thermodynamics, everything's breaking down, including my body and my cells and all of that. Okay, why? Well, what do you mean? I mean, it's the cycle of life. It's evolution. That's how it all works. Okay, but why does that break down? Why does it die? Why does everything running out of energy or, you know, whatever they want to say? They have no answer for the origin of death. Okay? Why is it just that way? And the Bible says it's because of sin. And if you don't have the logic of sin behind the dilemma of death, then you won't have the remedy for death either. And so you have to understand that death is the consequence not of, not of the body just running, running its course. Uh, you know, the, one of the worst lies you're going you're gonna to hear in this culture is that death is just part of life. You ever heard that? That is heresy. In the Bible, what is death called? Curse. Death is called a curse. Death is called the enemy. And the Bible says the last enemy that will be conquered. This is uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again, going, going down from verse 23 all the way to 28. The last enemy that will be conquered is what? Death. Praise God. He's going to do away with death. You see? And so death came directly through sin. And it is Death is a curse for many reasons, but one of the reasons why death is a curse, guys, is that it produces in man sinful self-preservation. Write it down, think about that, and go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Trisha, what's Trish? Please tell me if, like, I've got five minutes. I, you know me, I'll go an hour and people get mad afterwards, but tell me, tell me uh, when I'm up on my time there, dear. Uh, but Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, you see this here? What does it say? Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. This is just the author of Hebrews saying, Jesus, uh, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, he had to be one of us. He had to live exactly how we live. He had to enter into this world and live our life, the life that we're living Everything that we experience in this life, Jesus experienced. Hunger, pain, suffering, loss, persecution, etc. Everything except what? Sin. sin. Everything except sin. That's what it says. But he says here that through death, his death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. Who's that? That is the devil. Now, this is what I mean by self-preservation. Look at this. And to deliver all, who, all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. A very difficult verse to interpret, but after reading a bunch of stuff on it, basically what it's saying is that through the, the terror, John MacArthur calls death the king of terrors. Because, I mean, that's it. Once death comes knocking, who cares about cancer or you know, uh, getting laid off or who cares about anything at that point? It's death. It's over. And so what he's saying here is that through the fear of death, people are in a kind of bondage. They're in a kind of slavery. And you would think it would lead them to cry out for help, but actually it doesn't. It leads them to a kind of slavery to their own devices where they try to escape death or put it away or, or deny it or whatever and to preserve themselves. But it is at last, it is a lie. And, uh, and the only way that death can be overcome is through Jesus Christ. And so let's move on from there and just look at the, the universal nature of this curse. Because if you go back to Romans chapter 5, he says, so death spread to all men because all sinned. You see that? And at this point, Paul again here wants to emphasize something very, very interesting, very difficult. And this is where it gets really hard. Let's try to focus on this and then we'll, we'll finish here soon. He says here, for we hope, oh, excuse me, verse chapter 5, verse uh, verse uh, 13. This is actually a parenthesis. 13, and, and uh, this whole section here is kind of parenthetical, and then he resumes verse 12 and verse 14. In other words, it goes verse 14, ver, excuse me, verse 12, and then the logic goes to verse 14. Verse 13 is like a parenthesis, okay? And he says, for sin, he's trying to explain. For sin indeed was in the world before the law, and that is the law of Moses. 
before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no transgression. And so the question could be asked this. If people sinned before the law of Moses, but it wasn't counted, then why do they die? <laughs> right? If, if God doesn't count people's sins because the law was not given yet, okay, namely the law of Moses, then why do they die? And then Paul says, he doubles down, but yet death, death reigned. Oh, that's a powerful saying right there. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. It's undeniable that, okay, so before Mount Sinai, they didn't have the law, Ten Commandments and the law of Moses and everything, right? But it's also undeniable that everybody died in that time period. So then what gives? What gives is that they died in Adam. You see that? They're, they die mainly because they're identified with Adam. Do they sin as well? Oh, absolutely. Matter of fact, look at verse 12 again. Very controversial. I'll make a controversial statement here. When it says here, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. I believe there's a double, what's known as a double entendre there. We all sinned in Adam, but because we all sinned in Adam, guess what? We all sin. <laughs> you see? Because, and then we inherit a sin nature, and the evidence of that is that we now sin ourselves. But it is the sin of Adam that constitutes everyone under the curse of death. And so what he says, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Another difficult aspect of this passage. But I think what he means to say here when he says that is that he means to say something like, uh, because, you know, I think the best way we can take this is that death reigned even over those who did not have the ability to disobey an explicit command like Adam, because that's what Adam did. Um, just to explain this further, Paul says this, right? And notice how he doesn't really need to explain it. He just kind of says it. Go back to chapter 2 because it may be that he's amplifying something he already said. And that is uh, in chapter 2, verse 15. When he makes it clear that you don't even need to have the law of God to sin against God. He says, they show that the work of the law is written in their hearts. This is chapter 2, verse 15. Who's they? People, Gentiles who don't have the law of God. They don't have a Bible. Let, let's say they're in a remote island somewhere, never heard of Moses or the law or Jesus, nothing. But he says, those folks show the work of the law as it is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. And so there you go. What Paul is saying is that people who don't even have the revelation of God, they are revelatory beings. They have innate within them a conscience that testifies with the way they live and the way they operate. What? Watch this. Their, their conflicting thoughts are either accusing them or excusing them. And so no matter where you look in the pagan world, it doesn't matter what, the, what weird god or what stump or what stone they're worshiping, they know it's wrong to lie. They know it's wrong to murder. They know it's wrong to steal. And they don't even know what Moses is. It's because they're created by God. And this is what theologians would call con-created. Con-created knowledge. You see that? Uh, is that wrong? That's wrong. Knowledge. Con-created knowledge of God. Uh, knowledge. My wife always tells me, slow down. I'm like, I can't. I just, I just make a mess. But it's concreated knowledge of God. And what this means, beloved, is that, and I feel like I'm at church here a little bit, but anyway, what this means is that by virtue of being created in the image of God, every single human being that has ever lived has an innate knowledge of God within them. They just know. Uh, go back to Romans chapter 1. Yes, I was going to say it's in Romans 
Romans 1. You could finish the thought. Yeah. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men. This is Romans 1, 18. And he says, Who by their unrighteousness, what do they do? They suppress the truth. You see that? For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. In other words, contrary to some theologians like Thomas Aquinas, when God created Adam, Adam was not a discoverer in the garden looking around saying, somebody made all this, <laughs> right? He just knew that God created him. He knew that there was a creator. He knew that God was uh, divinely powerful. He just understood it axiomatically, just by virtue of being created by the hand of God. Last point, go back to Romans chapter 5, and we'll try to finish, unless you guys have a ton of questions for me, and then we'll just go on. What's the last phrase there in verse 14? He, Adam, he says, is a type of the one who was to come. You see that there? Uh, guys, here, we're going to go in. Do you guys have a, a, just a, a little bit longer? I don't want to scare you guys away, but this is very important. Uh, can you guys read that, that marker there? Uh, there you go. Yeah. Right. Now, typology is so important here. <coughs> It comes from the Greek word. Trisha, you have another marker for me somewhere? Tupos. Okay. Now let me read to you something a scholar said about this Greek word, tupos. This is Douglas Moo, a great theologian. I think he wrote the finest commentary uh, on the book of Romans that money can buy. He says here, it means originally the impression made by striking something. And I'll add to this because an example of this would be an impression that was often made in the Roman world with a signet ring. You ever seen like in a movie, right? They put a, a clay stamp and they, they leave the imprint right there, right? That was in the ancient world. That was called tupas. That was the imprint of, let's say, of a seal. It's like that. He says here, and through this imprint, he says, it designates a form, a pattern, or an example of something. Paul uses the word in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, to designate the Old Testament people of God as types, tupas, as types of the Corinthian believers. In other words, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is saying, look to the people in the, in the wilderness, look to the Jews, look to Israel in the wilderness, because they are a type of what you are now today. Sure, you're not wandering around in the desert in Egypt or, you know, the Sinai Peninsula, but in our lives, oh, fine print. That's not going to work. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We're almost done. But you see what I'm saying? What he's saying is that as you look to the Old Testament people of God, you have there an example, a type, a pattern of our own living right now. And we can go on and on and on on this. But when Paul says that Adam is a type of Christ, Br brothers and sisters, this is a glorious truth, what is being told here. We need another hour. Because what he, has said, what he just said, look at my wife. My wife's like, no! <laughs> what Paul just said, listen guys, look at your text real careful, right? Romans chapter 5, verse 14. He did not say that at that, let me just get this straight here. I'm just going to. Let me get this straight myself here. He, he didn't say this. He didn't say that Jesus, represented by the cross, sorry, is a type of Adam. Is that what he said there? He did not say that Jesus is a type of Adam. This is so important right here. You know why? Because liberal theologians have attempted to say that the apostles took Jesus and try to fit him into the scriptures. 
and try to say that the original meaning of the scriptures, uh, that they're forcing, that, that the Christians were forcing something on the original meaning of the scriptures that was not there. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. It's the complete opposite. Adam is actually patterned after Christ. And what, why is that significant, you guys? Is because what that results in, if you don't understand what typology or how it works, it doesn't res- listen, listen to this. You have a triangle of typology. And right here, we have the original. And here we have the type. And here we have the anti-type or the fulfillment. Now, as we think about Adam, what we're being told is that the earthly Adam is patterned after something before him, which is the eternal Son of God. And that's what arrives in Adam. When Jesus arrives on the scene, as history moves on, and we arrive at Adam, number two, this is the fulfillment. But when this arrives, it is no longer the type that arrived. It is the original again. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5 and we're done. Then we can eat cookies and, and, and that's it. We'll end with this right here. Hebrews chapter 5. To me, this is scintillating. Verse, oh, where is this? Three? Talking about Melchizedek, right? Um, Let's see here. Is it it five or seven? I'm sorry, excuse me. Hebrews 7. Beginning of verse 3. Melchizedek is an extremely mysterious person in the Bible. He's mentioned three times. Genesis 14, Psalm 110, and right here. And it says that he is without father, without mother, or genealogy. You can't figure out where this guy came from. You ever read Genesis 14? You know, Abraham's going along. Out of nowhere comes this guy, Melchizedek. And Abraham gives him tithes and starts tithing to him and giving him tenth of everything that he owns. And then nothing else is explained about Melchizedek again. He vanishes. And he says, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling, oh, not a good translation, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Neil, please help me with the NASB. What does the NASB say? It doesn't say resembling. Hebrews 7, verse 3, at the end. Yeah, yeah. He is made like the Son of God. Melchizedek, Adam, they are patterned after the eternal Son of God. Isn't that incredible? And that's where a passage like Luke 3, 38 again comes back into view. Because here we are told that Adam is the Son of God. Wonder where he got that idea. Wonder where he got that designation. Why does he fit that category? Because God has a son prior to Adam. (laughs) Namely, the eternal son of God. You see that? And so now we're starting to get the logic of why did God create Adam? Why did God put this man in the garden? Why is this man's legal, forensic, and covenantal situation so inextricably connected to Jesus? It's because he has always been a type of the eternal Son of God. It gets a lot deeper from there and because now we're starting talking about God's decrees and what God had purpose in the eternal kingdom of God. And that, I feel like a, this is a television show, and that we'll visit next time. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Anyway, any questions as we close here? Uh, a lot of good stuff there. Yes, ma'am. Um, so Thank you for asking a question. Brave enough. <laughs> Serial killers? Yeah. Wow, man. Like, 
<laughs> woman after my own heart. <laughs> You know, you know who to avoid in this world. That's for. Yes. But sometimes they'll go back to the roots of like this person, and when they were a child, it seems like they were like a sociopath or a psychopath since they were young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's patterns there. Yeah. How do you explain if they have zero conscience when they were a child? Like, if the law of God is written in their heart, but they they seem to have no awareness of sin. Well. I mean, at least when they tell a story, obviously. Yes, yes. But how do you explain that? Because there are kids, wow. you know, even kids, like, well, that seem to be yeah. that, that's a phenomenal question. That's a tough one. I'm tempted to say, let's close in prayer. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know that I have the infallible answer to that question. I would just say that, you know, obviously the conscience is invisible. It is not detected by man, but God knows it all together. And so they do have a conscience, and so we have to believe in Scripture, uh, regardless of what we see reflected in the life of people, you know. But but yeah, it, that that, if anything, to me, Kaylee would just speak about uh, just the um, the depths of total depravity, just how deep depravity runs, right? Because it shows you that outside of the redeeming work of Christ, in our in our sinful nature. You know, people can be born with these defects, you know, uh, where, where, and I've seen it, you know, some people are on the spectrum, you know, of stuff, and, and uh, it may not have some sort of explanation. It could be chemical. It could be the way they are born uh, and things like that. So I would just, you know, case by case basis, is there something chemically wrong with this person that wired them this way? Right? Or like you said, is there something in their upbringing where they lacked parental discipleship? They lacked the, the, the necessary uh, levels of accountability and, and uh, did they lack righteousness and a moral example? Some people have that. Some people are worse, right? Some of these psychopaths you're talking about grew up in the church. Their parents were you know, very faithful at church and they have a, a, a consciousness. But to me, it's just uh, an example of the wages of sin. And we shouldn't be surprised at that. I mean, what you're explaining, I mean, think about it. It's no different than what uh, Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse 5 says, that God flooded the whole world because it got so depraved. Remember what it said, that the thoughts and the intents of man's heart were only evil continually. And so left to themselves... Man is capable of anything. And so we cannot, uh, you, know, we, you know, somebody like that, I mean, it's just... It seems to you like a lot of them have like some type of traumatic event when uh -huh. they're young. Sure. Do you feel like that that can introduce some very demonic activity? Like that almost like... Sure. Like something in them to oh, like, sure. You know? Sure, of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, obviously your upbringing, right, mm -hmm. uh, can have a huge impact on the way that you... Uh, I can give you example after example after example as a pastor working with people that have extensive background in uh, this kind of environment or situation and has affected them into their adult life. I mean, that's, that's a dime a dozen, you know, so good question. Yeah. Uh, this conversation reminds me of, um, you remember the uh, thing that we, we saw it was they sold their souls for rock and roll. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, uh, Yeah, Anton LaVey. No, 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 I'm sorry. Um, uh, it's actually Alistair Crowley. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, his... Um, Man, way to end the Bible study, huh? <laughs> no, but he, he had said something that was really interesting because he said that yeah. he grew up in the church and he said that his, um, his choice to go into the satanic realm, that it wasn't for lack of belief in God mm. because of... Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he said it was because he wanted to know what was on the other side. Sure. And he started that yeah. at a very young age. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? So yeah. I think, again, like you said, yeah. you know, yeah. only God knows I, the secrets of Yeah, the no, I recently read a quote from the pulpit at church from Cornelius Van Til, theologian apologist, who said that it's precisely because they have the knowledge of God within them that their sin is precious to them. 
because they measure their sin against God and only, only highlights the enormity of their sin when they recognize that they're sinning against uh, you know, a creator who is holy and divine. And uh, I rather, I think I believe that, you know, that people sin precisely because they know it is evil what they're doing. So, you know, anyway. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, that's right. Any other questions at all? Any other kind of questions? Or should we, should we, should we break? Yeah, let me pray for us, and then we can keep talking about anything. Father, Lord, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for, uh, Lord, all these families that have come, and thank you for uh, just uh, fellowship in the gospel. We thank you for the truth of your word. Help us and remind us, Lord, that the righteousness that we need to overcome sin and death has been provided for us in Jesus Christ. And so bless us tonight as we fellowship. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Good. Good stuff. Good times. Good. Hung out with your pastor uh, yeah. at the conference. Yeah. How was that? Really good. Yeah, we, we talked for...